Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Greg Dippel. I'm a geologist in the Department of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences, and I've been a um, collabor collaborator with BRIM since its foundation. And I've also been working in carbon capture and storage in mine tailings for about 20 years. What I thought I would do today is give you a bit of an overview of where we've come over that time and understanding where there are opportunities to use the waste stream from mines to both capture and permanently store carbon dioxide within mine tailings. And then also give an overview of some of the directions that we see ourselves heading to into the, uh, into the coming years. And this is drawing on the work of many uh, students and postdocs uh, over the years, as well as um, colleagues such as Ellie. Um, and the work I'm gonna to present today has been uh, supported by the Canadian federal government through Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council and Natural Resources Canada as well as uh, by Geoscience BC, De Beers, FPX Nickel Corp, and Gigamels. So the goal here is to uh, pull car take carbon out of the atmosphere and store it over geologic time. And the holy grail for that is to put carbon dioxide in minerals. More than 90% of carbon on Earth is contained in minerals. It's where it likes to be thermodynamically. And if we look at the plot on the right, we can see that the storage capacity is in the tens of thousands of gigatons, and it can be stored for geologic time, i.e. millions of years. So this is really the holy grail of where to put the carbon dioxide that's been accumulating in the atmosphere. The challenges, the, the, the reactions that do that are generally very slow. To, to, for, for the project I'm talking about today, we take advantage of, of um, two features. First of all, we're focused on mine tailings that are derived from deposits hosted in ultramafic rocks. Ultramafic rocks are magnesium silicate rich rocks. They form at depth in the earth in the red, in this cross section showing both the oceanic and continental crust. They form out of equilibrium with air and with groundwater. And when they're exposed at the surface, they spontaneously react with CO2 to form carbonate minerals through a process called chemical weathering. That normally occurs very slowly, but if we extract that rock, and grind it in order to remove metals or diamonds, we end up generating material that's highly reactive. And so that's the opportunity we see here. We wanna be in rock material that is far from equilibrium with the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. And we wanna focus on the finely ground mine tailings in those systems in order to achieve carbon capture and storage in real time. So the process we're looking at is one, conceptually, really, we're stripping metals or cations from the minerals within the tailings. We're combining them with carbon dioxide that comes either directly from air or from concentrated streams of CO2. And we're bringing those two things together and forming uh, magnesium carbonate minerals, where the carbon dioxide is held uh, in a dense, easily monitored, and stable form. Now, when we want to do this in, 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 mine, in mine tailings, we find that materials have very different reactivities. And we focus on the reactive capacity of these materials to provide magnesium over short time scales. So on the plot on the left, we're looking at a reaction rate on a log scale. So there's a over 200 fold change in reaction rate across the vertical axis of this diagram. And these are the actual experimental data from the tailings of a nickel mine showing that, that you know, roughly um, eight or nine percent of the magnesium in those tailings is released at a fast rate, whereas the remaining 90 some percent is released at a slow rate. In order to look at carbon capture and storage technology that we can do at a cost of tens of dollars per ton CO2, we focus on this labile fraction of the magnesium and we want to prioritize extracting that magnesium and combining it with carbon dioxide. And we can see that that reactivity is fundamentally controlled by mineral content, and it's highly variable between different mines. We have, we have uh, tailings of a, a couple different mines here, a diamond mine, a, a gaucho koi mine, and, a, and nickel tailings from a nickel deposit in, in British Columbia. So that fraction can vary substantially. Uh, and so understanding the geologic control of that material is important. We know that these reactions can occur quickly. So baseline studies that we did in um, starting in around 2005, 2006, these are the um, mine tailings from the Mount Keith nickel mine in Western Australia shown in the upper left. We can see that the tailings which are deposited as a slurry are cemented. Uh, they're cemented by carbonate minerals. 
and our, ba and our baseline study at this site showed that the mine tailing storage facility at Mount Keith is capturing about 40,000 tons of CO2 per year and mineralizing it within their tailings. It's capturing it from the atmosphere and it's um, putting it into a stable mineral sink, which is stable over geologic time. This represents 12, about 12% 12 of mine emissions. It was happening accidentally and initially uh, unknowingly within their tailing storage facility. Based on work in this site and others, we've developed a number of approaches that we use to accelerate these reactions in order to speed this up. So the two technologies that we're pushing today, one of them looks directly at optimizing or enhancing the capture of CO2 from air from the tops of tailing storage facilities. And we just show a measurement device that we use to monitor this in the lower right-hand corner. And we can achieve substantial rates of CO2 capture directly from air in ultramafic mine tailings when they're managed properly. And we can achieve accelerations of up to two or three fold higher than what we saw at Mount Keith. Uh, the other approach we're doing is using tailings to capture CO2 from more concentrated streams of CO2. And in this example, this is from a uh, experiment we ran at the Gaucho Quay Diamond Mine in the Northwest Territories uh, in conjunction with De Beers, who sponsors this, this research. And in this instance, we took 10% uh, CO2 uh, in, in in gas, uh, representing flue gas from diesel combustion, and we flowed it through a six meter length of their um, tailings pipeline. And for 44 hours, the uh, no CO2 was uh, escaped at the far end of the pipe. So we were flowing this gas through the pipe, through their tailings at a rate of about a liter per minute. And for 44 hours, that CO2 was all captured within the tailings and mineralized. So what are the pathways to, to implementing this approach? So we say three different uh, opportunities. One is with closed mines. One can exam, uh, imagine that you can integrate this with reclamation. There's roughly 3 billion tons of ultramafic mine waste in Canada from the asbestos industry. Um, this probably represents one-time opportunities of sequestering on the order of 10 to 100 million tons of CO2 based on legacy mine tailings uh, in Canada and elsewhere. In operating mines, we estimate that the, the easily accessible capacity to capture and store CO2 is probably on the order of a few million tons per year, based on a capacity of one to 200 million tons per year. That's based on active mining. Um, and really it's also, also limited by the idea of trying to do incremental changes to ongoing activities in order to uh, reduce and offset mine emissions. The last example we want to look at is if we start to look at the development of new mines, understanding where the reactive materials are in these mines and treating that waste specially will allow for design and build of efficiency and a maximum CO2 uptake. This will allow us to reduce the supply chain greenhouse gas impacts of metals such as nickel and, and cobalt and also provide opportunity potentially for net negative emissions. So this slide here is meant to sort of illustrate this. This slide shows tons of CO2 emitted per ton tailings per year. And in the red colors, reds to pinks, we see emissions from different mines that we've worked at. And then we looked at the reactivity of tailings from different tailings materials within deposits and between deposits. What we find is the capacity for ultramafic tailings to capture and mineralize CO2 is actually depends on the technology. So depending on the concentration of CO2 in the gas that's supplying the CO2, we have a different capacity to store carbon dioxide. High purity streams of CO2 allow for more, um, high purity forms of CO2 extract more magnesium from the tailings and so you have a greater capacity. But a lot of the capacity that we can get comes from CO2 reactivity in air. So you can imagine the dark green is an opportunity to offset uh, Hall fleet emissions because we, um, so that if you're running your fleet on diesel you could, and emitting that CO2 into the atmosphere, you could recapture it from the air into your tailings and offset that. If you have fossil fuel generation on site, such as natural gas or diesel, then that presents opportunity to capture additional CO2 and sequestered in tailings using more concentrated streams of CO2 within the flue gases. The difference in the height of the green bars here is really meant to illustrate that some portions of mines are highly reactive and they present a greater opportunity to capture and, and mineralize carbon dioxide than the less reactive bits. And if one's going to put into place procedures to capture and store CO2, we want to understand where these materials are and focus our activity on them. In terms of 
um, creating low carbon footprint mines for the future through a lot of the uh, technologies that Ali talked about earlier, we can imagine that the carbon footprint of mining is going to be greatly reduced. And so we see the implementation of capture and storage and tailings as the approach that we want to use to get the hardest to abate emissions. So we reduce the emissions of mine operations as much as possible through renewable energy, uh, changing the fleet, etc. And if we couple that with mines that have a high capacity to capture and mineralize CO2, we can actually look at putting forward um, mine operations that are not net zero, they're net negative. They actually contribute to carbon removal from the atmosphere and a lowering of the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So I will uh, finish with just one example and a summary slide because I appreciate that we have um, We've been going a little over schedule. So this is an example from the Baptiste deposit in um, North Central British Columbia by FPX uh, Nickel. Uh, what we have there is using exploration geochemical data we've present, we have uh, calculated the labile magnesium content and the distribution of labile magnesium over a billion ton nickel deposit by looking at the millions of tons of ore and different labile magnesium contents in the plot in the lower right, we can see that there's a, there's a very thin tail of highly reactive material. And so the capacity of the material at high labile magnesium content to store CO2 is much greater than the average material. On this basis, if we look at the plan for the mine in the future, we can see that if we react only the 30% of the tailings production that is the most reactive, we will result in a carbon neutral mine and if we react or if we treat mine tailings, a uh, greater proportion of the mine tailings, this mine will be net negative. And this number of 30% is actually great, is, is been reduced to less than 30% based on the latest uh, plant, mine plans that have been released, been released by FPX Nickel. So I, I covered all that in the one slide. So where we're at in terms of um, deploying this technology, we have two technologies that uh, one for direct air capture, one for flue gas injection that are at technology readiness levels five to six. We've been uh, in the last couple of years and ongoing this year, we are deploying field pilots at the one to 10 meter scale. This means capturing and storing CO2 on the kilogram scale. We are ramping up both direct air capture and flue gas injection for 100 meter scale pilots at site to allow for capture and storage of CO2 on the ton scale uh, starting in 2022. And in order to achieve, to achieve these at relatively low cost, the technology is relatively simple. The key thing is understanding where the highly reactive tailings are and deploying the technology and the interventions on the most reactive materials. The other real uh, game changer that's happened over the last 18 months is the recognition that we should be imagining a future where the cost of carbon cap, where the cost of carbon is more than 40 or $50 a ton. Clearly it's gonna be into the one to $200 a ton range um, potentially fairly quickly. And this is, this is causing us to go back and pull some technology that we had kind of shelved a few years ago, thinking that, that was, time was not ripe for developing them. So we're now revisiting and redeploying some technologies that are a little bit more elaborate. They'll have a higher cost, but they will allow uh, more carbon to be captured and stored within tailings. Uh, recognized. So if we want to get more carbon capture within the tailing stream, we can do that at a higher cost per ton carbon. We're starting to pull some of those technologies and trying to move them from the bench scale to higher levels. And those right now are at technology readiness levels two or three. In order to actually do this in the real world, we see partnerships as being absolutely key. We need to, uh, these, these processes depend on mine design, they depend on the geological variability of the material, and they're affected by climate. So we have to go in with a toolbox approach, identify the technology with the site and the opportunity, and we need to partner, partner with, um, with mining companies in order to find the best uh, environments in which to deploy these technologies. So with that approach, I'll leave you with a schematic that my PhD student um, Sterling Vanderzee created, kind of showing some of the options here, the, the, the cold to hot colors in the underground part of this diagram are meant to show the highly variable distribution of labile magnesium within ultramafic rocks. As we understand where the highly reactive material is, it can be preferentially intercepted and used to, for example, stabilize ta tailings dams and be used for CO2 injection 
while the less reactive material might sit out away from the beaches within the tailings piles and be used for direct air capture. So here we're integrating capture from air as well in as injection of concentrated streams of CO2. And we've integrated our understanding of the geology of the deposit with mine operations and with the building of the tailing storage facility in order to optimize and maximize carbon sequestration. Thank you.